Welcome from the IIBA Tampa Bay, Florida chapter. This is our study group for June 29th of 2023. This is our 84th study group. Uh, tonight, we're going to go over the techniques, organizational modeling, and SWOT analysis. Uh, just a housekeeping note, next month, the month of July, we're going to take the month off. We're going to be returning in August of 2023 to continue our every Thursday night study group, and we'll continue and finish off of our techniques. Our study group is a international study group. Our mission is to bridge the gap between industry leaders and business analysts by building partnerships with professionals, educators, and employers so that we may empower, instruct, and engage the BA community. It is our job to help you uh, learn what you wanna learn. And if you're attending live, we really appreciate it if you participate in the conversation. If you're attending by recording, we really appreciate it if you reach out to us and let us know that you got some benefit out of this. It motivates us to keep going. As I said, this is our every Thursday night study group that happens between 7 and 8 p.m. Eastern time. You can reach our past meeting recordings here at this address. Cliff will be dropping this into the chat. We also have an IIBA site meetup sites, Zoom, Facebook, and LinkedIn sites. So we've given you lots of ways to reach out to us if you have any questions. Watermark Learning has provided their services free to us and we claim them as our sponsor. They've also given us a discount code, Tampa Space 21. This gives you 20% off of all their products. They not only have business analysis, but other products of other topics. In business analysis, they have flashcards, classes, practice study, test questions, uh, quite a number of other things. We encourage you to look and see what they have. We are a volunteer-run organization. Our board is led by Cliff. He's our president. You'll see here he's in, uh, looks like the Millennium Falcon. Is that right, Cliff? Yes. Millennium yep. Falcon. He switches it up on me every once in a while. I have to figure out which geeky thing I'm thinking of now. Uh, Yo-Yo is our vice president of finance. Kaylin and Priscilla are board members at large. Uh, we have a new board member at large that's re that's joining us, uh, and I haven't gotten word that it's official yet, so let me know when that's official. I'll update the slide. Uh, we have, my am the study group leader. My name is Thea Soren. I'm the vice president of career and professional development, and once again, if you're interested in joining our board, let us know. Not only do you get different credit for joining the board, but it also is really good for your resume. Uh, we allow you to do either something that you've never done before, something you haven't done in a long time, or something that you're really good at, whatever we need to benefit the organization. This study group is accredited by the IBA because we have CBAPs in residence. Uh, Bob Churchill is our head CBAP. Uh, he also has his PMP and a variety of other certifications he's earned. He has a website called rpchurchill.com where he has not only business analysis, but a wide variety of other topics that he's done, webinars, articles, provide spreadsheets, all kinds of really interesting things for any BA to know. Uh, we also have Yulia. She was a member of our study group for a long time, and then she got her certification in September. We are very proud. Uh, we have a variety of other people who also got their certification. Bonnie, Frank, Renu, Nino, Tish uh, have gotten certifications. I added Renu's other new certification that she earned the other day. Um, if you receive certifications by uh, after attending our study group, and if you feel like we did you any good, let us put you on our board and let us claim the win. We feel like we are here. Uh, we don't charge money. We don't We don't ask you to contribute. We don't ask anything for, of you except your participation. But this allows us to say we did a good thing. Uh, let's see, we will have our next study group meeting August 6th of 2023. So I want you to come back and visit us then. Don't, don't stop coming just because we have the month of July off. Uh, uh, several of us are doing our traveling. I'm going to go visit my son who has stage four cancer. Um, we, we need a break to go take care of some stuff. So let us have July off, come back and visit us in August and we'll get started again. Has this August 6th the right date? Am I getting hey, it? August 3rd, it should be. A... August 3rd. I was looking at that thinking, that's not right. Okay, August 3rd, thank you for correcting me. 
it just felt funny. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Bob. He's going to start on either organizational modeling or SWOT analysis. But again, we want your participation because the conversation is what makes the study group more intelligent and more beneficial for not only the participants, but those who watch it on recording. So Bob, I'm going to stop sharing and let you have the screen. So I guess we will start with the SWOT analysis. Bob, I can see your screen, but I'm not seeing anything come up yet. Are you having transmission issues? I am thinking that's possibly true. Yeah, it looks like he's frozen. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I find, I, I want to just count it as fortunate that he froze in that expression, because, you know, you get people that, for, you know, they freeze with their eyes crossed or whatever, and then you have to try to look patient and not laugh. So at least we have this. Oh, and welcome back, James. Good seeing you in a while. Do we have... Jim here? Yes, hi. Hi, Jim. We're happy that you were able to log on to, again today. I know, Jim. Looks like you're on mute, Jim. Maybe he's having transmission problems, too. I don't know. Recently, Zoom is just acting weird. Hmm. I have issues. I don't know. I'm not alone. <laughs> No, no, you're not alone. Okay, well, I tell you what, instead of making y'all all wait, um, when Bob is able to share again, I'll give him back the screen, but until then I'll start, I'll just go through what we have in the Babok. SWOT analysis uh, is, is technique number 46. Uh, Y'all, whenever he comes back, let me know, okay? Uh, SWOT is a tool that, to evaluate organization strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. SWOT is an acronym for those four things, and it's for both internal and external conditions. So you're going to make a SWOT analysis for a specific thing. For instance, you're going to make a SWOT analysis for to evaluate vendors, or you're gonna make a SWOT analysis to evaluate something very specific. It wouldn't be both internal and external in the same SWOT analysis. Uh, let's see. Uh, the language is brief, specific, realistic, and supported by evidence. It serves in a, as an evaluation of an organization against identified success factors. It can be performed at any scale, but you need to keep it at the same level of granularity for each of the elements being evaluated. You wouldn't want to evaluate one element at a really high level and another one at a really granular level. For instance, um, whole, whole company, a division, a business unit, a project, whatever weight, whichever level of granularity you have, that's what you want to evaluate every one at the same thing. So what you want to use it for? Evaluation of an organization's current environment, uh, share information learned with stakeholders, identify the best possible options to meet the organization's needs, 
identify potential barriers to success and create action plans to overcome those barriers, adjust and redefine plans throughout a project as new needs arise. This infers that there's going to be a constant update. Every time there's a change, you need to reevaluate that change against the SWOT analysis. Identify areas of strength that will assist the organization in implementing new strategies. Again, reevaluate upon every change. Develop criteria for evaluating project success based upon a given set of requirements. So you need to outline your set of requirements prior to creating the SWOT. Uh, identify areas of weaknesses that could undermine project goals and develop strategies to address outstanding threats. So as you look at the, the SWOT, you're going to always have your four areas, but as you have those areas identified and, and refined, then you can talk about, okay, so here's threats. What do we do about these? So it just gives you a, a jump off point for some of these things. Any questions or comments so far? Okay. Um, of course, I already talked about strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats. Um, strengths uh, may include experienced professionals, I'm sorry, experienced personnel, uh, effective processes, IT systems, customer relationships, or any other internal factor that leads to success. So whenever you're, again, looking at any of the the elements that you're evaluating against each other, be sure that you look at each one for exactly the same things. Uh, weaknesses, actions or functions that the assessed body does poorly or not at all, you almost have to be the one to determine how to scale that, how to determine those things. Um, if you want to say this website is has a weakness because it it doesn't have good logic, or this website has a weakness because it doesn't bring customers all the way through the funnel. Those are two totally different things. One is customer experience and one is, is trying to achieve a funnel to, so that you get people to actually buy in your website. So you need to focus it very specifically as to what your goal is for the SWAT. Opportunities, external factors of which assess group may be able to take advantage, new markets, new technology changes, in the competitive marketplace or other forces. So this is any opportunity. So it's pretty much wide open. And then threats, again, external factors that can negatively affect this, the assessed group. Uh, entrance into the market of a new competitor, economic downturns, other forces. I would submit that whenever you're talking about threats to an organization, you also need to talk about morale, personnel turnover, uh, all types of things that can potentially affect change. If the organization is changing their processes frequently or just recently changed their processes, count that as a threat because that's going to impact the morale. It's going to impact the training. It's going to impact how fast they can complete their process. It's going to affect their uh, how they hit the market. Uh, it may impact the way that they're their customers perceive them because something's going to be slower in shipping or something like that. So look at all of the things that could potentially change the performance of an organization. So this is what a SWOT analysis typically looks like. Uh, you can list your opportunities, you can list your threats, strengths and weaknesses, but then here is where you place things. Any questions I just on this? Add, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, during the exam, usually they give a scenario and ask you, they let tell you certain things and ask you whether it's a strength or a weakness and which quadrant does it fall. So you have to be very sure uh, about whether it's an external first thing, whether it's something external or whether it is something internal to the organization. And then once you know that, then you can make it, then you can find out whether it's an opportunity and threat. So this quadrant question comes a lot in CBAP exam. So these two are external, correct? And these two are internal, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So strengths and weaknesses are internal. What are the, like if somebody has already developed 
uh, software with AI technology, then they, that's a strength. They already have that thing. But if uh, and so that's internal. And if there's an opportunity, could be like some uh, some uh, like it's mentioned, you know, there's a new market that is coming up and you already have the solution for that new market. So now that's you already have a strength. Uh, you and you also have an opportunity so you fall into the first quadrant which is a best case scenario here you are in a win-win situation here and i don't know if you can see this this has the initials of of these out here so this is so here's st yeah. here's wo and wt so i don't know if the test calls it that but if they do say would it be the wt quadrant you know that that's weakness and threat that would be this quadrant down here. What are my questions about this? Okay, moving on. I sure hope everything's okay with Bob. Okay, uses considerations. The strengths, it's a valuable tool to aid in understanding of an organization, product, process, or stakeholders. And it enables business analysts to direct stakeholders focus to the factors that are important to the business. So be sure that as you're defining what you're measuring, that it lines up with the business values, the business goals, and things that would impact the business's bottom line. And I would also say things that impact the, the business people's morale, because you know morale is something that can really handicap a company. Limitations. The results of a SWOT analysis provide a high-level view. More detailed analysis is often needed. And unless a clear, a clear context is defined for the SWOT analysis, the results may be unfocused and contain factors which are not relevant to the current situation. So it's really easy for someone who has never done a SWOT analysis to just start. And what they end up with is something that is too fuzzy. You need to have very specific guidelines as to what you're trying to look at, what you're trying to accomplish, and you're at the same level of granularity as you perform the SWOT analysis. This is a great tool to use whenever you're trying to get some people to talk about a project. It's a great tool to use if you focus them with a SWOT analysis. It's almost like brainstorming because it makes people look at things from a couple of different perspectives at once, but it gets them to talk about it. If you're having trouble getting a group of people to discuss a topic, you know, it's like everybody's just sitting back, say, well, I think that there's a weakness here and I'm going to I'm going to identify this in the SWOT analysis and the weakness is going to impact us in this way. And people will kind of go, what do you mean there's a weakness? Because if you start with the weaknesses or threats, it gets them a little concerned. You know, they're sitting back thinking everything's fine. So suddenly you start to talk about weaknesses and threats. What? So they'll get engaged a little faster than they would if you just say, oh, if there's nothing to talk about, we can adjourn the meeting, you know. If you have one in the meeting, you might as well use it. What questions do I have about a SWOT analysis? Has anyone ever used a SWOT analysis in your entire career? Yes? Nope. Can you talk about it? <laughs> or no. You're back. Yeah. I talked really fast, so you have lots of time to continue. Well, um, like many of these uh, techniques, I don't actually have a whole lot to say about it. It's a pretty straightforward um, process. So you compare uh, or contrast strengths and weaknesses and against opportunities and threats, and it's pretty straightforward. I mean, what questions could there be? There are 50 of these techniques, and uh, the bad bug does not go into a lot of detail on a lot of them, and there is a reason for that. Um, it is an organized, like Thea said, way to make you think about problems from a certain perspectives that cover a lot of combinations. You know that picture I show you over and over again about the cube that look like different letters? 
depending on the different directions you look at them from. There are a lot of techniques that are organized ways of doing that in different um, uh, combinations. So there's not much to say about that. So if you're talking about wanting practice to use a SWOT analysis, think about something like this. I want to buy a car. I have specific goals for a car for my own personal use. So here's my specific goals. Here are the five cars that I'm considering. Use a SWOT analysis. Do they meet those specific goals? How, how would they be impacted if you did the SWOT analysis and looked at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? Um, you might find out that if you haven't considered it, what would the threats be? Go look it up and see how often it has to be repaired. Does it, how much does it cost to be repaired? It's going to trigger you on starting to ask the questions that maybe you wouldn't have asked otherwise. And you'll come out with, here's like the top two cars left instead of the top five cars that I'm interested in. And the car that I thought I wanted, now that I understand all this new stuff, don't want it so much anymore. Um, one thing that I included in the blog post I wrote for this is uh, variations of this may appear in ways that are somewhat unexpected. So I know uh, one company I worked for surveyed all their people to find out what uh, um, uh, skills they had and what subject matter areas they had experience in them. Um, and, and so we could maybe think about different opportunities to pursue. And that was a form of SWOT analysis. It was only one quarter of it. But um, these things do stealthily show up. Um, a lot of times you think about how to deal with threats, um, competitions, new um, um, regulations, um, loss of contracts, things like that, overall business conditions, and you figure out how to uh, mitigate those. So that those are all forms of um, SWOT analysis. You may not do all of them in one uh, exercise, but every um, time you do something in one of those quadrants, that's part of the analysis. So anytime you have a choice between two or more things, you can consider a SWOT analysis as a potential technique to use. In some circumstances. Okay. I mean, choices come in many forms, right? Yeah. Are there any questions about a SWOT analysis? Okay. Oh, I apologize. I didn't announce this at the beginning. After our meeting today, we're going to talk about how to get the hours that you need to stay certified your recertification credits. So if y'all wanna stay on after that, after we finish our normal meeting, please do. We'll continue to record and, and have that available to you if you need it, but your participation is always appreciated. And thank you to those of you who are going to stay on to talk about your experiences there too. Please continue, Bob. All right, uh, let's go over to organizational modeling. And there are a lot of kinds of models we can build. And uh, ones of organizations are very key. Um, you will often see a lot of humorous org charts. 
like they did one of the old Soviet Union, which showed the entire population um, in a mass down at the bottom, and then like a red star, like five people in a star up at the top to show the um, Central Committee and maybe a layer of um, Politburo and nomenclatura. But there are all kinds of funny ones out there. Um, there was a humorous one I saw that talked about, okay, all these people's kids go to school together. This guy hates that guy. Those two are having an affair. Those like the cowboys. Those like um, the um, titans or something like that. And they're fighting with each other. Those people play golf together. If you, I think I um talked about it um, down here someplace. Um, but uh, Sir John Funny or Chicher, um, George, you'll find a lot of different kinds of things. Um, so what in or chart is, here's one for a company I worked for. I was down here someplace. Um, so there's a president and CEO, and he had two VPs. And then uh, most of the major departments had managers and sprouted people under them. I was in. We lose Bob again. Bob, we cannot hear you. It's audio. Keep trying to talk. We'll tell you when we can hear you. Uh, I'm not sure. Sometimes the video takes up a lot of bandwidth. So if you, if you want to turn off video. No, nope, can't hear you yet. Hmm. You know, this is the first time we've had trouble with Zoom. Yeah. Yes. That I can remember. Well, I don't know what Bob was going to say, but I'll fill in the time. How's that? Okay. I know we got an upgrade today in Zoom. Is that what it is? Yeah, maybe. We are the beta test. Keep trying, Bob. <laughs> I'll let you interrupt me anytime. Okay, so from a business analysis perspective, whenever I join an organization, I'm a contractor very frequently. Having an org chart is is golden. However, uh, now I can hear you. All right, probably not good. I changed the input device. We um, can hear you just fine. All right. So anyway, to continue, there are some departments that are shared. There are multiple like uh, drafting, supported boat design and build and some other things. I'm loath to try to expand this anymore because it might blow everything up again. <laughs> I really need to get into my new machine. Um, so there are a lot of ways to do this. When um, you try to create a hierarchical diagram of any kind, you're always faced with the problem of how to sort things or how to define a taxonomy. So this is a functional taxonomy and there are a lot of special assistants and individuals and sub departments like the secretarial staff and the uh, accounting staff. You know, this was an engineering company. Um, there were a whole sales department and uh, a whole education and training department, experiments and studies, um, design and build, 
research and development control systems. And these things all uh, work together on some projects and uh, they function independently. There, there were a lot of times we just sold control systems uh, by ourselves, right? So we were the only ones to work on that project. And there are a lot of ways to do a hierarchy. This is more or less by manager and job function, but you can also go by um, department and you may have multiple divisions that may all have the same job functions under them. So these things may take a lot of forms. So that's one type of organization I worked in. Most of the places I worked in my career were highly technical vendors that uh, served larger organizations. They were relatively limited in size and did something uh, very specialized and potentially highly technical. There were probably only uh, maybe 10 companies in the world that built the kind of furnaces we built. So here's another example of an org chart. And this was a typical air defense artillery battery that I was assigned to uh, when I was in the Army. So what we see here is I've included uh, all the people in the union and given some indication of all the vehicles that were in the unit too. So we have a battery commander who's the senior officer and the executive officer. And then we have the senior enlisted guy, the first sergeant, he's an E8, all our platoon sergeants, so the senior enlisted guy in charge of each platoon, usually in E7. Um, and then you have squad leaders or track commanders. So we have three platoons, each with uh, four Vulcan air defense cannons, which were um, a 20 millimeter Gatling gun mounted on an armored personnel carrier chassis. These are museum pieces. Now they're all retired, but I'm old. So that's how that goes. Um, squad leaders are usually E5 or E6. Then you have a senior gunner, a driver, and possibly an assistant gunner. So um, you'll have a number of squads. Each um, or a platoon will have an executive or a platoon leader, which is the officer, a lieutenant, either first or second. And uh, they'll have somebody to drive the APC that the um, uh, platoon leader will operate out of. And then the senior enlisted guy, the platoon sergeant, will live out of a jeep with a little trailer. And he'll have a driver also. And then there's a headquarters section with the motor warrant, a warrant officer is somebody who's a senior technician of some kind who gets promoted out of the uh, enlisted ranks and goes to something that's lower than an officer. It has a platoon sergeant, um, and then there are people that there are, there are mechanics, there are um, other specialists like uh, communications, nuclear, biological, and chemi um, chemical. There is the mess um, crew, 
and uh, there was the supply in arms room, and uh, I was in armor for a while, and uh, the battery training NCO probably drive the four sergeants uh, pick a truck around. There's a captain's driver that had a Chevy Blazer, and there was somebody who drove the uh, 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 platoon leaders or motor warrants vehicle. I can't remember what they had. And they had trucks and uh, uh, vehicles that were strong enough to tow other vehicles like a VTR and various things. So there are standard uh, symbols for different kinds of military units. And there is an accepted organization for all these things. An artillery a unit of this size is called a battery in the uh, armor or cavalry, they'll call them troops. Um, in a uh, normal infantry unit, they'll call them a company or many others. And uh, um, there are probably detachments and other weird designation. So every type of organization has a um, uh, vocabulary of its own. And somewhere in here, a link to um, the a table that describes how the military does all its stuff. Um, usually when um, they're describing high level conglomerations of people, or they show how such units are deployed in the field when they're doing strategy and so on. There would be symbols for all these things and it's just understood um, how these things work. Now, here's where it gets interesting. You can have a matrix organization, which means, um, Everybody in the grid uh, kind of reports at, uh, more than one kind of function. So you might have a manager for your job function, and then you'll have a manager for each given, pro um, like uh, a business union may share people or individual project managers and so on. So if you plug that out as a grid, you'll have the managers or responsible parties along the top and down the side. And then all the people um, go in the boxes within the grid. And there are problems when management and control in those situations, you may end up people, um, with people that have responsibility, but no authority. So there are all kinds of weird things that can go on. So, um, yeah, one, um, the Babog talks about a few things that organizational models have. So um, you can break things down by function, by um, unit. Sometimes they're broken down by geographical region, product line, or something else. Um, and then you will have uh, matrix things like I've described. Um, there would be definitions for different roles, so I'd probably belabor that point quite a bit, but that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you can show different charts, and you can show uh, who influences what. Um, in Hooking all this together, you can have interfaces, and they can be between departments and so on. So um, 
in this organization, I could go talk to the drafting or design and build people at any level because it was a small group of professionals who all knew and trusted each other. So that's fine. But there are other situations where um, managers at a high level um, keep things siloed. Uh, they discourage people from talking to each other and uh, make everything go through them. And that is really annoying. So that's uh, most of what I have to say on that subject. Does anybody have any questions? I don't have a question, but I have things to add. Is that okay? Please go. I've used organizational modeling in several different scenarios that it wasn't traditional, but it was beneficial. For instance, at a nuclear power plant, you need to know what each person's role is, but you also need to know in case of emergency, what their role is for that particular emergency. Uh, they had specific roles, they had specific places that they had to be reporting to within a certain amount of time. Then at that location, they had roles that they had to had to uh, fulfill. There was no negotiation on that. We had to have those people at those roles. So you had to be able to know at a glance who had to be where, uh, what clearance did they have, what information did they need, uh, just it was so much easier to just have it on the organizational model than to try to create something different to do that. Um, in medical diagnostics, whenever you're talking about who has what certifications, whenever people come in to check your certifications, having it on the organizational model is a whole lot easier than trying to maintain a separate list uh, just to be able to provide proof that you had the, the certifications as well as, uh, you know, here, here's the dates and, and um, when they were renewed last. It also helped in identifying, if you color code it, identifying whose renewals were coming up uh, so that you can be sure that your, your certifications were maintained properly. Uh, so there's a whole lot of different ways to use an organizational model, uh, but as Bob said earlier, the influencers may not be listed in the places you would expect on an organizational model. Sometimes the influencers are the people that everyone goes to to ask questions of. They may not hold a title that would make you know as a new person to the organization that they would be the influencers. So look and see, and it's a lot harder now that we're not in, in office, but it used to be you'd look to see who had people outside their office waiting to ask them questions. You know, who did people say, we got to go talk to Bob about that? Well, Bob is the influencer, but he didn't necessarily have a title. Now you have to do it uh, by watching in, in meetings. Who do people stop to ask questions of? Uh, who's involved in all the, the emails, other, other things like that. Uh, but if you ha do have a current organizational model, you can notate it on your own as well as uh, it helps you to just know, especially as a new person in an organization, who to go talk to about specific things. As a business analyst, this is a great tool to be able to use, to be able to say, hey, you've got a, a legal department. Um, who do I talk to? Oh, here's, here's who I talk to. Is this the right person to talk to? You know, who do I need to talk to for regulatory? Who do I need to talk to for whatever? And just have the names right there in front of you. I personally have had a problem with names. I had a, a boss one time who would say, go talk to blah, 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 blah. And I could not understand him because he, the way he pronounced the words, it was a whole lot easier to say, oh, that's this guy, right? You know, uh, to have it on the organizational model, especially if there were five people with the same first name. I got it right because I had something that I could reference and, and be very specific as to who the person was I needed to go talk to. Okay, that's all I have to add. So I have something to add here. Please do. Uh, so uh, based on my experience, yes, these organizational modeling is very important because when we when we start talking to the clients, we understand we need to know who has the authority to approve, who has the authority to prioritize, 
and who is the one who whom we should reach in case of escalations and who are the point of contacts for whom to reach for detailed information on a specific topic or on a specific subject. So these organization models are very helpful to us and we, we create our stakeholder lists and RACI based on this, that as well. So that helps us while we are driving our elicitation and collaboration and while we are doing our other uh, uh, requirements management and when we are when we have to get a sign off on our documents so these are very helpful i i have a couple of other thoughts first of all there are formal and informal leaders like theo was saying the informal ones might not have a spot on the chart um specifically called out but they have been born the other thing i'll say and this is a fairly recent uh, recognition by me i've talked for a long time about the difference between thinking about how we do the engagement versus how we build the solution and analyze that. But a lot of business analysis activities also have to do with improving the environment we're working in. And that means the organization. So um, you'll have uh, a lot of things that aren't just about processes um, that are the purview of the BA. Yeah. Or and things that you can contribute to. Sorry, go ahead. Thanks. Um, and in terms of CBAP exam, I, I remember, I don't remember exactly, but in one of our mock-up exam or in one of my mock-up exams or um, C, CBAP, I don't remember. So there were questions about influencers. So this is just a two lines in the entire BABOC about influencer, but we need to exactly understand who an influencer is. The person whom everybody goes for advice or directions and the person who speaks for the group. So that's an influencer. So, so when we are going through BABOC, sometimes just one or two lines are important enough for entire question. So we may just miss it. So. Any other comments or questions about org charts? Okay. Well, if we have exhausted that, why don't we go on into how to track your hours for recertification once you do get your certification, what the limitations are, uh, what information you need. Uh, Bob, you said that you had a recent, um, you, you went and looked to, to see how you did it whenever you originally started. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I'm trying to bring that up now. So. There are a few main ways that you will get uh, credits. So one way, um, one classification of things you can do is attending meetings. Every time you show up uh, for a meeting, once you have your certification, by the way, so there was a certain amount um of hours you need to take the exam originally that's a little bit different although you'll have a record of it so i took a class online with people all over the world through adaptive us in the summer of 2017 so that's this 35 hours but after that, I went to chapter meetings in Pittsburgh, Baltimore, DC, and later um, uh, uh, Orlando and Tampa. I used to drive down to Tampa and hang out with all the people there. And you get um, an hour or an hour and a half for all those. I think I included some zeros here because 
I was doing something else during that time that, and didn't want to double count. So um, you get a lot of things that way. For those um, of you that have your cert, I think you can get up to 30 hours of this in, uh, or 30 PDUs for an RCDUs, whatever we're calling them. Um, every certification has different uh, names for these things. So I cannot keep them all straight. And you enter them in here. And that's a way to get a bunch. Um, I took an online course to support my CBDA before I let that lapse. Um, so that showed up here also. Now... We have to refresh. Please don't die. All right, let's go back here and go backwards. All right, so that was professional development. And then you have work history. But uh, for me, this was uh, all to get my original cert, but you can earn, I think, up to 10 CDUs for a refresh just by working. Um, and then professional activities, these are where I've given presentations. And uh, I have done a number of them. I've given two webinar series of 11 and 14 talks. I'm giving a, a, the current webinar series has run for the last 14 weeks. Now, um, they all take me a decent amount of time to prepare. And they last about an hour or close to each and you get 10 credits for this. You can only get um, um, 30 PDUs for this, or GDUs, I can't remember. And here's when I've given all those. Um, one thing that will happen if you, um, you can carry over up to 20 credits from one three-year cycle to the next. So when you get to 60 or whatever you need for that particular search, don't stop. Um, getting extra this time will make it easier for the next time. And uh, let's go back one more time. Um, Bob, so the in professional activities, so you get uh, CDUs irrespective of your time, right? Uh, so if you have attended, presented in one activity, one activity, one presentation, that is 10 CDUs, whether you, whether it was a two hour presentation or a three hour, right? Um, I that I don't know. It have there's a manual or a certification guide the IIBA publishes that mm -hmm. as a PDF that you can get through IIBA.org. Yeah, I, I have it. Your, so yeah, yeah. It says per activity. So uh, so like I I'm asking you because. Since you have given a lot of presentations, so some may be an hour long, some may be more than that, but you are getting for each activity. You are not logging uh, uh, how many hours you spent for each activity, well, right? I, uh, I guess. So I gave variations of the first presentation I mm -hmm. did um, in six different venues. And mm -hmm. although I updated it and improved it, um, none of the second um, five uh, really required a full um uh, a full 10 hours of prep, and yet I got um 10 CDUs for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, says yeah. CDUs here. So, mm -hmm. um, 
So I guess, yeah, you get 10. Now, if something's only 20 minutes, I might only claim four or five I prorate in. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if somebody, if uh, two different people are presenting during class here, you know, um, uh, maybe each would claim five, but I don't know what the formal rules are. I just know what I've done. Now mm -hmm. we have volunteer service down here. Two of these are park cleanups. And uh, one is a product camp I helped set that up a few years ago. Um, there is self-directed learning and there's formal academic education. So I think the uh, one item I had up above um, was a Udemy course that I took in data analysis of some kind, maybe that would go here, but I usually get so many um, from all the other spots that it's not an issue. So I just report everything I do subject to the patients I have. Um, uh, writing all this stuff down and flogging all these entry forms and I let it go from there. And if you want to know how one of these goes, if I wanted to um, report one of these, I choose an event and I would start entering the information here. So these are fairly straightforward. And um, uh, Cliff and Thea maintained attendance for all these events. That's why they need to know your name. Um, so you want to include their contact information in here and uh, uh, describe the organization name and the title and so on. And uh, the start and end date for a one-day event might just be the same date. Um, this is not... And so contact name. Whose contact name? Um, if you will. Uh, either Cliff or Thea, whoever um, uh, maintains a uh, um, attendance for the event and mostly they're not going to call them but um they were uh, the iiba was mad at me for some reason they actually audited me and i'm still cheesed about i got audited too for exam ranu did you get audited yeah they yeah me too me too been for everything it's like give me a break Anyway, um, so one thing that um, comes up is you sometimes have to um, talk about knowledge areas. So what you want to do is choose these based on what um, certification you're trying to renew. So the first six are really about the CBAP and um, some of the other ones here. Um, they are product ownership. These five are um, about the uh, CBDA, which I know Renew just got. And uh, you have to be careful. There's a guide someplace that gives the numbers and titles on the knowledge area. So you might want to, uh, you know, talk about what knowledge areas um, uh, given activities associated with them, and you highlight it and use these arrows to move them back and forth. All right, it won't let me move it back, but I'm gonna cancel this. 
So that's basically how it works. It's a little bit tedious, but, um, you know, it works and they eventually figure it out. And, and one important thing is that after seven days, it doesn't let you edit the activity or anything that you have made in the development log. So we make sure you are entering it right or uh, if you want to make edits to it, then do it within seven days of creation, edit or delete. That's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I do to, um, uh, provide some extra documentation is on link things to um, uh, my website and the recordings I've posted. And, uh, now that the chapter has uh, or is in the process of putting all these meetings online on YouTube, you can link to those directly as well. I'm eventually on my website going to build a um, list of links to all the meetings we've done and all these specific discussions we've had on individual techniques, guest speakers, knowledge areas, and so on. So that'll make a lot of things easier to find. And Cliff will share that with you, I'm sure, once I um, made some headway on that. Sure. We do have, I, I, I have gotten all the videos up on our YouTube channel. So all the study groups, all the other stuff that we, we've done, a couple of pres special presentations. So they're all out there. YouTube channel actually looks pretty good. Um, and of course, tonight's recording will be out there shortly. But um, yeah, it, it, it's much better than the, the, the drive that we had. Yeah, thanks, That's Cliff. I, I I did view some of them. Yeah, they look they they are so easily accessible now. You know, so you can just go and see them. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's something I should have done a long time ago. Just needed to kick in the butt <laughs> to do it. That's all. And uh, once you have entered enough credits in. Uh, things someplace on your dashboard will say you have enough, then you go ahead and hit a different button at the top level that says, go ahead and renew and you'll pay the fee and uh, you'll submit. And then they will um, eventually tell you they've accepted it and they'll make your updated certificate available to you and uh, change your status to show you're good for another X number of years. It's three for CBAP, the um, CBDA goes one at a time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any last questions regarding recertification hours? I actually just had a question about uh, how to log in your working hours. Like, do you just log in your annual working hours or is it every month? I, I don't think you have to do it every month. I think you just need to do it before your yeah, it's your sort of continuous yeah That's the cool. continuous time period so you can just mention continuous time period like let's say from 1st april to if you have been in six months continuously 1st april to whatever six months and then a number of hours would be if your work hour work day is 7.25 or eight hours accordingly mm -hmm. you calculate the number of hours and mm -hmm. distribute it in different knowledge areas there Okay. So I had a start date of 2010 and an end date of 2015. And yeah. um, I had, you know, a few hours um, spread across numerous uh, uh, knowledge areas. And it was only about um, to, like 
not 10,000 working hours, but only about 2,000 uh, were germane to uh, this activity. But that was enough to get me my initial sir. No. There were, uh, there, these things are reasonably flexible. Yeah, but I remember from recertification books that 1,000 hours is equal to one hour of CDU. I'm sorry, yeah. 1,000 is? 1,000 working hours is equal to one hour of CDU. Five yeah. hours of you CDU. You don't get Five CDUs. a lot Five? for I just see. working. Yeah. So if you are a full time or BA, then it means that in six months you can uh, uh, actually uh, get five CDUs for six months if you are a full time BA. And so 10 CDUs per year you can collect if you're a full time BA. Okay. But you can only get five, up yeah. to 10. Let me see. Why. Work history, yeah, 1000 hours is five CDU and work history can be done maximum 25 hours for 25 CDU. hours. Yeah, you so can claim. There are maximums you can get in every category. Work history is 25 self-directed, 15 um, professional development, which is sitting in these 30 um, professional activities, giving presentations, whatever, 30, volunteer, 30. So um, I know that I attend PSBAW conferences sometimes and get a few hours from those. And I have some carryovers from my last cycle. Okay, do we have any last questions before we wrap up? Okay, thank you everyone. Bob, specifically, thank you for doing your presentation. That was great. Uh, we will be taking the month of July off. We'll come back in August. We'll continue. If you're interested in presenting any of the techniques, the techniques are now available in our, uh, our study group folder that Cliff has put in the chat. So if you see a technique or two or three or five that you're interested in presenting, all we need from you is for you to actually look at what's in the Babok, uh, tell us what's in the Babok, and if you have any personal experience with it or any re research that you've done regarding it, let us know that too. Doesn't need to be more than 10, 15 minutes to cover what's in the Babok if that's all it takes. Um, any last questions? No. Please volunteer. <laughs> I'm sure people would rather listen to you than to me. <laughs> it is, um, it is the strain for Bob to have to do both both techniques for a meeting. So if y'all can help out, that's always appreciated. Okay, and, ladies. Uh, what, yeah. What's the name of the YouTube channel? Uh, Cliff. If you if you search, the link is in the chat, but okay. um. If you search for IIBA Tampa Bay, you'll find it. All right, thank you. And if you look at our our uh, Google folder, there's lots of things that people have contributed of things that they've figured out, they've created uh, that helps everyone do better as far as being a BA or study for the test. Uh, as you know, this is our 80 something um, study group. We've got lots of these recorded. And Cliff has been kind enough to get them all up on YouTube for us. Okay, guys, I will see you in a month. And we'll come back all sunburned and, and happy. <laughs> um, but be safe. Do something good for yourself. And take care of people you love. See you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, see you in August. All right. Bye-bye. See you in August. Bye.